Hello, my name's Mark Fraser. I'm Teaching and Learning Lead at the Centre for Evaluation and Monitoring, CEM, which is part of the Cambridge family. And we'd like to talk today, myself and my colleague Natasha, about dealing with disruption and how you might be able to use formative assessment to support student resilience. Especially in the current climate, following a year of unprecedented social and educational disruption, detecting a sudden or unexpected decline in a student's performance may indicate that there are circumstances that are preventing your students from being able to re-engage with their normal routines. Resilience, or the ability to bounce back is a valuable trait that we often take for granted. Most people recover from small disruptions quite easily. However, recent events may have had a considerable negative impact on some of our students and they may struggle to recover. They may have lost loved ones, have felt isolated or just become detached from the world of education. Ensuring that they are on track and are not, to made, are not made to feel overwhelmed by workload on their return is something that can be managed more effectively with an objective approach to classroom assessment. The formative use of assessment is widely recognised as being a process central to effective teaching and learning. Indeed, much of what many teachers instinctively do on a daily basis could be classified as being formative. For example, good teachers continually observe their students and respond appropriately, appropriately to their work and provide timely and actionable feedback. Chem systems can support your observations by providing you with quick and objective ways of validating your views on how your students are performing. I'd like to pass now to my colleague, Natasha. Thank you, Mark. Um, hello, everyone. I'm the Regional Chem Assessment Lead for Cambridge International. Um, I'm based in Dubai and cover the Middle East and North Africa region. I spend most of my time talking with teachers and school leaders about how best to use baseline assessments to achieve um, the best possible student outcomes. So, Today, we've been asked to talk about the importance of resilience in education, especially, as Mark said, in the light of the current pandemic. Um, some of you will already know me as the, the Chem Baseline Assessment Manager for Cambridge Assessment, but I actually started my career teaching English as a foreign language well over a decade ago. So approaching today's session, I wanted to reflect on my own teaching experience and how resilience in the classroom featured. I absolutely loved my teaching career. It took me all over the world to Vietnam, Japan, Italy, Oman, um, Egypt. And back then, I don't recall there being such an emphasis on non-academic skills and especially concepts such as resilience. It was more about making past participles somewhat fun. And certainly when I first started teaching in public schools in Italy, there was even more emphasis on rote learning and teaching to the test. Um, but that doesn't mean that I and other teachers were not embedding resilience into our classroom practice. I taught every age and level from, from the age of four to 70. And remember that for me, there was nothing more satisfying than seeing my students passionately engaging with the English language, to see confidence grow, to see students enthusiastically working together on a shared project. Um, looking back, I think I was often the teacher who got the, uh, in, in quotation marks, the difficult students. Um, and one of those students actually wrote me this letter after our course. Um, I think I don't, I didn't have the words to express what resilience in education was at that time. But looking back, practices such as increasing a sense of self-worth, community, determination and engagement were actually a part of this. So today I want to use my own experiences, past and present, to unpack what we mean by resilience, why it's important to actively incorporate it into teaching practice now and how certain types of baseline data can help us focus on it. And then Mark is going to talk about using formative assessment to support student resilience. 
So moving on, what do we actually mean by resilience in the context of education? So let's think of resilience as a stress ball. Um, a stress ball is resilient because it springs back to its original shape after being squeezed. So we can define resilience as the ability to spring back when one experiences failure, setbacks and hurdles that can sometimes hamper progress on the path to successful learning within the classroom and indeed beyond. And resilience is often misunderstood as an individual skill gained only in adulthood. Um, I actually have an 18 month old, there he is. Um, and while I was writing this talk, I thought about him and it made me reflect that resilience is something humans are born with to, to different degrees. I see my son fall down thousands of times, experiment with language, with varying degrees of coherence. And he still gets up each day, really enthusiastic to try all again, practice over and over despite uh, failing. Um, many adults would stop after trying a few times and see this as failure. But babies and young children fail time and time again, but somehow carry on and grow and develop. But not all adults or older children will. So what exactly happens between being born and becoming adults? And why does resilience and the ability to continue after failure seem to falter in some? Perhaps if we perceive resilience as a trait that develops naturally in adulthood, we assume that everyone will find their strength on their own. Yet these skills do not always develop without being nurtured and trained. So what can we as teachers do in these crucial childhood years? So let's define now what resilience is. So um, some researchers um, have found that there are many factors within resiliency, and these include social competence and pro-social values, optimism, purpose, an attachment to family and school, problem solving skills, an effective coping style, and a positive self-image. Teachers can promote these factors of resilience on a regular basis so that students have inner resources when they become frustrated and we'll look at how assessment can support us to do this later on. Have a look at these. And how many of these do you recognise? I definitely recognise some of these from my, from my classroom years. Identifying some of these can help us spot students who might be in need of our support at this time. Um, I'm sure many of you that can relate to these sorts of comments or attitudes, um, but teachers can encourage a different mindset. So instead of, I'm not smart, it would be, I'm not good at this yet, but I will learn. Instead of, it's too hard, it will be, this will require effort and finding the right strategy. I give up, I will get through this. I am not worthy, I deserve love, happiness and health, and I'm scared to make a mistake. I, this is one of the ones I really, really do remember. Instead of that, when I make a mistake, I will learn and get better. Um, and I deliberately put these in a thought bubble instead of a speech bubble, because students don't always articulate these attitudes. In a classroom setting, you may be able to spot this in body language or behavior, but that behavior can manifest itself in different ways. And when you've got a class of 20 or 30 to teach, you can't physically spend much individual time. And I know some of you are um, still on remote teaching. So with that, teacher intervention can be even more challenging. So things to think about as, as we're going through the presentation today. So I'm now going to hand, hand back to Mark and he's going to talk about how the current challenges we're facing in the classrooms um, and, and what to do about them. Thanks, Natasha. So as Natasha's just mentioned there, I'm just going to have a, a think about understanding the challenges that are currently facing us. And Every school year traditionally brings with it a host of new challenges, but the, the current school year is like, like no other before it. 
the COVID-19 crisis has caused widespread school closures in at least 188 countries that we know of, and it's estimated that 1.7 billion children and young people and their families have been badly disrupted. Many children have been out of the classroom for months at a time, depending on where they live. We are facing not only potential learning loss, but an impact on educational aspirations and disengagement from school altogether. So recovering lost learning is one priority, but this should not be our only focus. The well-being of young people is vital too. And as Natasha's just referred to the work of Carhill and others, um, suggest that individual resilience is a valuable trait in society and in the workplace. So we need to be preparing our children and young folk for the future. And that seems quite uncertain at the moment. So the pandemic has been a truly international disaster. And as always, it's often those with the least who are most vulnerable. Andreas Schleicher from uh, the OECD goes on in his um, report that I just showed you the first quotation from. And he says, education is no exception. Students from privileged backgrounds, supported by their parents and eager and able to learn, could find their way past closed school doors to alternative learning opportunities. But those from disadvantaged backgrounds often remain shut out when their schools shut down. The crisis has exposed the many deficiencies and inequalities in education, from access to computers and internet connections needed for online education to supportive environments needed to focus on learning. Now, that is, as we said a few moments ago, not an equitable situation at all. And students, particularly those most most vulnerable and most exposed will have um, fared far less well than many of their colleagues. So it's, it's learners in these marginalized groups that we need to think about. And as teachers know, the range of abilities and skills demonstrated by their students is often wide. And this year, this disparity between children's educational and social experiences during lockdown will undoubtedly exacerbate this gap magnifying disadvantages and allowing some children to slip even further behind. So knowing precisely where all students are starting from when they return to school is invaluable. It's important that teachers and school leaders have ways to quickly evaluate students' needs so that they can act to address the potential issues. So Accessing academic performance alone is unlikely to be sufficient in the current circumstances and individual students' well-being is of paramount importance. So a decline in academic performance may be a sign that there are other more deep-rooted problems causing the student anxiety. Students who have performed well in the past but who now show a marked downturn in their attainment could be struggling to cope. And it's likely that they've also experienced a weakening of their resilience. Conscientious students will be well aware of their situation, but may feel unable to do much about it. Identifying these students must be a priority. Recognizing the signs which may point to them and supporting them to rebuild their confidence and resilience is a challenge many teachers currently face. In the short term, it's difficult to spot students who are struggling to keep up with the expected pace of study. People and you know, young people in general are generally very good at putting on a brave face or you know, hiding their problems. And these problems often only become apparent once it's too late. The symptoms of feeling overwhelmed and helpless are as varied as the potential causes. And lacking a sense of resilience is a long-term problem, which takes time and attention to address in a meaningful way. It's important that teachers and school leaders have ways to quickly evaluate their needs 
of the students so that they can act to address these issues before they become too deep rooted. Another OECD publication provides some useful guidance for teachers managing their students' return to formal education. It identifies three key steps. Firstly, assessing student needs and outcomes. So it's essential to assess where students are academically and what their emotional needs are. Many of them will have experienced trauma and this assessment should especially take note of students who do not re-engage with school, who don't return or who return but are very minimally engaged with schoolwork. Be essential to develop individualized strategies to retain the engagement of those students and their families. Recovering learning loss. Now this is easier said than done. Firstly, and we know from the research that's out there and little bits of research that Kem's doing at the moment, that this is far easier said than done. And it's not uniformly distributed. Some children will come out of this without too much damage. They've probably had a lot of attention and support. Some children, some students will have had nothing. So additional learning time will be necessary to minim minimize the long-term impact of those losses where they exist. Created, creating expanded learning opportunities might involve extending the duration of the school day, extending the number of days of instruction per week, or extending learning into the traditional summer holidays. The third strand is to rebalance the curriculum. And it may be necessary to re-examine instructional priorities for the coming year. And schools must respond to the needs of their students I think it's fairly safe to say that there will not be a one-size-fits-all solution. So it would be necessary to evaluate what the needs are in your particular school setting and tailor your response accordingly. So how can CHEM help? Identifying learners who are not in line with expectation is perhaps one of the most useful signposts to issues relating to well-being and resilience. Teachers generally know their students very well and any anomalies in student performance tend to, be, tend to ring alarm bells. Again, thinking back to my time in school, I felt I had a very good relationship with the children and their families and quite often when something wasn't right, it was easy to spot the signs. CHEM offers assessments and carrying out one of our baseline assessments perhaps will not provide an answer to the problem of lost resilience or lost motivation, or even begin to explain what that problem is. It may, however, be the starting point of a conversation with a student in order to better understand what the broader issues are. So a baseline assessment that I've just referred to is a way of quickly providing an overview of what your students know and can do in key aspects of learning. A baseline assessment can allow practitioners to develop a comprehensive overview very quickly. It can identify students who have drifted away from the expected pathway. It can form an evidence base for grouping and supporting learners, helping to inform teachers when directing resources. And it can also provide a useful benchmark from which future progress may be measured. Our approach is to pro provide evidence-based insight. So carrying out a baseline assessment this year may help provide further insight into students' lost learning. The Center for Evaluation and Monitoring has amassed a considerable amount of student-level assessment data over the past 30 years. And this information allows us to in very, very clearly understand students' age-related expectations relating to their attainment and progress. 
We hope that comparing this year's data to our established benchmarks will help, help to expose problems at an early stage, allowing teachers to react quickly and decisively. Our assessment services help our customers to transform the learning of all their students at every stage of their education. And we do that with this range of computer-based assessments. So we have five main products in the core product range from BASE through to ALICE. And as you can see, in between, there are three other assessments which cover the age ranges typically from early years until post-16 education. The chem assessment products complement the Cambridge pathway, offering an objective and comprehensive overview of student skills in key aspects of learning. These include literacy, mathematics, nonverbal reasoning, and personal, social, and emotional development. I'm aware that the, the writing on this slide is quite small, but I'm sure the slides are available later on. And if you require any more information on our systems, there'll be details at the end as to how you might contact us to find out a little bit more. So here's a quick look at some of what our computer-based assessments look like. And the next few slides include examples of questions taken from our early years, primary and pre-16 systems. This first example is taken from BASE, our baseline assessment for the early years. And it starts off with very, very simple questions. The child is guided through by an adult, and we start off with very basic concepts such as spotting patterns, we look at letter recognition, number recognition, basic reading skills, basic numeracy skills. And it's just a very quick way. It's a kind of checklist. Nothing's at stake here. This is just for teacher information. You can quickly find out what your children can do and by process of elimination, work out what they need to do next in order to move their learning on. The questions become uh, progressively more complicated as we move up through the age range. This is an example of a maths question taken from our INCAS assessment, which is our assessment for primary age students. By this point, the, the children are working more independently and are guiding themselves through the assessment, whereas BASE was is, is typically administered one-to-one -one by a teacher and a child. The next slide is from one of our uh, pre-16 secondary assessments. And this, again, is just becoming a little bit more technical, far more sort of challenging for older, older students and gradually increasing in complexity and challenge. And this is a particular example taken from one of our uh, secondary systems, again, targeting older and more able students. So following the assessment, we present reports which outline how individual students and groups of students performed. The information we provide to teachers ranges from simple tables of scores, which, which list your students' standardized scores, like shown in this example, which is taken from BASE. I don't expect you to be able to read that very clearly, but basically you can see for each row, we have one student, we know which class, or group they're from and how they performed in the case of base in literacy and maths and an overall score at the start of year and also at the end of year. But again, what do you do with a standardized score like that? How do you make it actionable? Well, in a system like base, we use simple visualizations like these arrow reports, which provide contextual information on what a student currently knows or can do in the key areas of learning. So basically the student starts their learning journey at the bottom of the arrow at the start of year with this little left hand bar and they move up. So start of year score is represented here. End of year score is represented higher up on the right hand side of the arrow. And we have arrows for literacy, mathematics, 
and personal, social and emotional development. And alongside, there is a small statement, a very brief statement, which just gives a little bit of context to those numerical scores. And in BASE, it's possible to drill down a little bit more deeply into the information. And BASE provides this more detailed feedback on the individual learner within what we call the thin strands. So you have the thick strand, which is say literacy, and then below that you have six thin strands. You can see on this report concepts about print, letter recognition, reading, vocab, phonological awareness, and matching. And this, this information allows teachers to better understand what this pupil knows and can do. Are there any areas of weakness or opportunities for development or strengths that I as a teacher wasn't aware of? And can I actually accommodate this pupil's needs within my classroom or do I need help and support from elsewhere? So that's on an individual level. From that, we can visualize the data sorry, just position that slide there, into a group visualization like this, where we have what we call the little test tubes. And in this diagram, each strand of the literacy assessment is represented by the rows, and each column ordinarily would have the name of a child under each column, so we'd know who each of these children were and how they performed. So in the base, reports like this. The light blue represents how the child did at the start of year assessment. The dark blue represents how the child did at the end of year assessment. And showing the data like this just gives a very sort of snapshot view of how your class was doing at those two key points throughout the year. So you can see in vocab, in vocabulary here, the children came in and they were generally quite able and they've made a little bit of progress across the year. Some added context is the red dotted line, which shows where the age related expectation is based on our observations with thousands and thousands of children who've done these over the years. Or you can see at the bottom where reading, there's virtually nothing showing for start of year. There's virtually no light blue. However, by the end of the year, they've been topped up. The little pots have been topped up with the dark blue and children have really made progress here. So as a teacher, I'd be thinking, well, my teacher, looking back, this has been really useful because at the start of year, I could see that the children were really struggling to even register on the scale in reading. However, with the input I have provided across the year, they've done really well. For some children, they've come up to expectation in terms of what we would naturally expect them to be, but I can identify little groups of children here, say that there's four children in the middle of that row who really just need a little bit of support as they move into the next year group. So again, it just helps us to answer the question, is this group performing in line with expectation and does this information raise any concerns in particular areas of learning? Reports from our primary system are a little bit more technical. So this is from INCAS and are more statistically robust perhaps. The INCAS system mainly reports age equivalent scores, which a lot of teachers find really useful. And over the past decade, we've amassed an enormous amount of assessment data, and this is used to provide contextualized and norm reference scores. So in other words, it's easy to compare a student's performance on a single assessment and over time work out if they are in line with age-related expectations. We always point out with chem assessments that there is this is not an exact science. This is a snapshot view. This is a one-off assessment. Typically, INCAS would be carried out just once a year. And teachers should never hang everything on this. They, they should just use this as one tool in the toolkit. And sometimes it just throws up the unexpected. The INCAS reports look a little bit complicated when you first see them, but basically this is just the age equivalent score up the side, up the left-hand axis here. And for each of the key areas, so we've got the reading modules in the top graph and just for example, we have the, the maths modules in the bottom graph, and we can see how this pupil has performed in the word recognition, word decoding, comprehension, 
and spelling exercise on the the top x on the top graph there the green line just suggests where they typically are according to their age and the little blue dot shows how they performed in that assessment so i'd be thinking this this child here has maybe done quite well as above the expectation, but for whatever reason, they've slipped a little bit behind in word decoding. Uh, maybe I just need to give them a little bit more attention and a bit of support there. However, the little bars that stick out from that blue square just show this sort of typical range of where that child's score may have fallen. On a good day, they'd be somewhere near the top, and in which case they'd be nicely in line or just over age-related expectation. So again, we mustn't read too much into this, but this is just a general indication of how a student is doing. In terms of group performance, you can, we show in Incus, uh, a table of scores like this, and then use your classic uh, box and whisker diagram. You can see these tiny little red blotches here are the names of the children in the class and how they've performed. The green line is just the age re related expectation line. This is how they should be. So as a, as a whole, this class is slightly below age related expectation. However, you've got a group of children up here are doing really quite well, but we've got a number of children down here who really need that support. And as I mentioned earlier, these are possibly the children who are suffering in terms of lost learning or a loss of resilience whose well-being has maybe suffered in the past year. These are the children who I would be looking at and again taking a holistic view, looking at the work in class, how they engage in class, what typically have I seen that they have produced over the last year, all of those things that teachers just do as a matter of course. Like the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. You put all of the pieces together to build up a more accurate and more reflective picture. And it is possible as well to show not just one class, but you can see how classes across the school. So this, this is a, a representation of a single form entry school, just where you've just got one class or one, one year group. So as the years go by, you can see they start off in this case and they're maybe just just about in line with expectation. That, that mean level of uh, attainment is just on the green line there. But next year, they've moved on quite nicely. They've moved on again quite nicely. There's a little bit of a dip as we come here, but then you know we finish off and the children are really doing quite well. But again, it's the children at the top who you want to be looking at to see how can I challenge them. And it's the children towards the bottom of the, the graph who you're thinking, right, I need to look at these children carefully and make sure that they are getting the support they need. Just to finish off, um, I've talked a lot about academic you know, attainment there. However, Cambridge University Press have developed a very nice set of uh, booklets and resources which are called the Cambridge Life Competencies Framework. And it's a useful and a free resource and it's something that you might want to have a look at. We've got seven different modules. There's an introductory booklet as well, which, and we can see across the range of what we would call 21st century skills, because a possible consequence of school closures and the isolation some students will have experienced during the last year is a greatly reduced chance to develop these key life skills. For some, not having regular face-to-face -face contact with their peers and teachers will have greatly reduced the opportunity to refine and improve their abilities in a range of key competencies. So this resource, as mentioned, is available free of charge and is an excellent starting point for teachers wishing to help their students develop these 21st century skills in the areas such as collaboration, communication, critical and creative thinking, as well as emotional development. The framework spans the age ranges from the early years to the workplace, so is universally relevant. I think the link to these resources is included at the end of this presentation. So hopefully I've been able to provide you with uh, some ideas as to what you might do to measure attainment and work out where your children are on return to the classroom. Have a think about who is of concern using this information 
and then to develop these more rounded and you know functional 21st century skills there's a resource here for you to to have a look at and with that i'm going to pass back to natasha thank you mark um so as mark said i hope that as as he was speaking you were able to reflect on your own context and the importance of fostering resilience in your own students and how baseline assessments could help you identify where you could start to address possible issues effectively. I'm going to finish off with three key takeaway tips to promote resilience in the classroom. Uh, I remember very well that as teachers, you need to be really skilled in teaching the individual as well as the class. I often talk about baseline data as an extra set of eyes. If you have data which is not reliant on curriculum knowledge, especially now with school closures, you know where a child is starting from. So you can create flight paths which have ambitious but obtainable goals. So for example, for some children, getting a D is a massive achievement and, and should be celebrated. Not all children are going to get A stars. So teaching children to commit to something and work hard no matter what and achieve what is their personal best is key. And remember, also celebrate success and achievements in terms of character strengths rather than flaws and only letter grades. Secondly, moving away from just focusing on, as I said, summative assessment can help both teachers and students replace beliefs that their abilities are fixed. So a fixed mindset with beliefs that their abilities can develop. So a growth mindset. Adopting a growth mindset can yield more resilient attitudes. So if you remember from right at the beginning, my son practicing his jumping, you'll notice that in a toddler that the inability to jump or form a sentence is, is rarely permanent, just as improving in any school subject is permanent. So as teachers, we should teach children that hard work is part of the process and practice as well, and that failure really is only inevitable if you give up. Lastly, uh, and similarly, when you're in the classroom, of course, keep on praising students who get the answer right and get top marks, especially if they put in a lot of effort. But also try to compliment a student when they take a responsible risk in class and don't always get the best results, such as answering a question wrong or stumbling on words while reading out loud. Volunteering to go first for a class presentation is also a responsible risk. These are opportunities to build confidence, optimism and risk taking, and most importantly, to keep a resilient momentum going forward while in a safe space. I'm going to conclude by saying I, I really, really enjoyed preparing for today's talk um, as it brought back really fond memories of, of what an important role teachers have, not just to impart knowledge, but passion, confidence, and a growth mindset. Um, I hope today has given you ideas about how you can find more opportunities to embed a culture of resilience in your classrooms and the role that baseline data can have to help you do that, and especially to those who may need it the most. Um, it might be a school-wide culture, which is something school leaders today can think about, uh, and it can also be what you as an individual teacher does. Um, but do start talking about the action you can take and evaluate the effectiveness of what you're already doing. Um, and again, baseline data and reports can help you do this. So um, in case you're interested, these are the um, references that we've uh, been using for today's presentation. Um, if you are interested in, in finding out about more about CHEM, uh, please reach out to your local Cambridge representative, whether they are from the press or from um, Cambridge International. Um, you can also visit um, www.chem.org. There's lots of information there, demo videos, and also lots of free training and other webinars which talk 
about lots of different things that you can do with chem, uh, whether you're a school leader, whether you're a teacher, whether you teach about primary, secondary, everything. Um, so there's lots and lots of um, resources there. So please do check it out. So um, from Mark and me, have a fantastic day and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you for listening.